It's Brian Preston, the money guy. So let's jump right in. Let's start with uh, sort of stage one, level one, the first stage of wealth. We have just dubbed it the stability stage. This is essentially keeping your head above water and making sure that you have the basics covered. So first step, stability. This is where you would think, this is where people aren't worried about just being able to pay the bills. That's right. Keeping the lights on. Yep. What really made me sad about this book is we're talking about the five levels of wealth to find out that the lion's share of Americans don't even make it out of the starting gate, meaning they don't even reach level one. Yeah, and it's not just us uh, supposing that's the case. There's actually been a study that shows 40% of Americans, this is from the Urban Institute, have trouble paying for all of their basic needs. When you think about uh, food, shelter, electricity, health care, 40% of Americans have problems just covering those four basic levels. It's even worse than that. I mean, not only can they not cover basics, if they have any type of hiccups, mm-hmm. any I mean, think about the hot water heater giving them trouble. Sure. Thinking about just covering your deductible or copay for a medical exam, yep. all these things, even dropping your iPhone in the commode <laughs> could be catastrophic sure. for you if you can't reach level one of your wealth. And we've seen that just by... How much? Can, how many people can come up with a thousand bucks? Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. If you've listened for any amount of time, you've heard this statistic before. This is from Bankrate. As of 2020, 59 percent of Americans have less than a thousand dollars in savings. So it's just like you said, that hiccup, that uh oh, that oh no. Almost 60 percent of folks out there could not come up with that thousand bucks. That certainly, to me, does not sound like stability. That doesn't sound like a stable footing. So I want to get philosophical just for a second before we start to talk about how do you get yourself in these bad situations sure. where you don't have enough money. We've done quite a few shows on the relationship between money and happiness. Yep. And one of the first things you hear is that stat that happiness is somewhere between seventy to seventy-five thousand dollars, and all that means now to me, that's not full happiness. That basically means you have the basics right. covered, which is step number one: is stability. Is that people just want to be able to feed their family, mm-hmm. they want to be able to shelter their family, and they want to make sure that they they feel comfortable. Right. That is the first thing. So if it's just that basic, these are the basic things: feeding yourself giving yourself shelter, and also making sure that you can just cover the basics. Mm-hmm. Why do we run astray and have so many problems? Yeah, and I think I think what happens is the way that we've gotten here is a mindset. It's not really understanding money the right way. And there's a really easy way that I see a lot of people, I have friends, I have family members who fall prey to this, and it's thinking that they can afford anything one month at a time. Yeah. So long as the monthly payment is low enough, it means it's inside the realm of affordability. That is a flawed mindset. Yeah, I mean, that's where the marketers are smarter than us all. They, they apply to some of those behavioral traps or manipulations mm-hmm. yep. to where these people that probably came out of school with rocket science degrees or mathematical degrees, they have figured out ways to create about everything can be afforded for $200 That's a month. exactly right. It doesn't yeah. matter how expensive it yep. is. It's just expand out how long you'll be paying for it, but they can get it to you for $200. So I wanted to kind of transition everybody. These are the big mistakes mm-hmm. that keep you poor. And we want to focus on these because these are the things, if you can have a healthy relationship with these big mistakes and not fall into the traps, you will have a huge leg up from the majority of your peers. So the biggest one that most people see first or that most people see the biggest, because this is for most folks, the largest purchase you will ever make is your home. Well, as you can imagine, if it's probably the biggest purchase you ever make and you do it poorly and you make a mistake, that mistake can have huge ripples throughout the rest of your financial life. So... Let's go through some guidance here. We sure. actually, and look, we did median, so we take out some of the, the the highs and lows that can distort figures. And we found out w- what the average income was. Sure. We found out what the average house, and then we put a multiple on that. So let's see what that calculated yeah, out so to. Yeah, so here's what we know. We know that uh, when it comes to like home affordability, someone says, how much house can I afford? There's a really loose rule of thumb that says you can afford about three times your annual salary. That's and we right. said, great, okay. Let's go test that. Let's look at some actual analytics to see if we as an American population are doing this well. And this is what we found. The median household income, according to the Federal Reserve Economic Database, is about $68,703. So that's the median income in this country right now. Well, we also know that the median price of a new home is just a hair under $330,000. 
Well, if you're good at math in your head, you probably figured out that's about 4.8 times the median income. Well, we just said the good rule of thumb is you can afford about three times your annual income, but the American average is almost five times. So that just immediately screams to me that most Americans, by and large, are buying more house than they can truly afford. Yeah, and they're probably house rich, life poor. That's exactly and that's right. a big problem. So focus on that. Remember, we also talk about if you're looking for guidance, make sure, try to keep your housing expenses, and I'm talking about principal, interest, and taxes, mm -hmm. below 25%. That's right. I know if you live in a coastal community or on, on the left or you know west side or east side of the country, that might definitely you know skew up towards 30 percent sure. but if you are going above 25 percent you have to get aggressive mm -hmm. somewhere else so pay attention to housing costs because it is definitely one of those expenses that can keep you poor if you're doing it wrong absolutely so if we know that houses are maybe the biggest purchase that we make another really big purchase that a lot of americans make and a lot of americans make poorly is automobiles. Automobiles. Well, for sure. We've done this. We've covered it. I consider it financial napalm. We, you know, mm -hmm. this thing will blow up your finances quicker than anything else. And here's the, the thing I think about. We talk about if you want to do cars well, mm -hmm. 23 8. That's, exactly That's right. all you have to remember is it's a basic rule. And we'll cover that in a little bit sure. in, under the indicators of success. But that's not, unfortunately, what's going on. What's actually going on out there, Bob? Yeah, so if we think that 23.8 is what makes sense, what do Americans actually do? Well, what we found is that the average auto loan term for new cars right now in this country is 72 months. That is over five. That's exactly six years. I'm good at math. That is a six-year auto loan. And this is what I thought was remarkable. And I actually didn't know this until Daniel found this stat and showed it to us. One in three people who trade in their vehicle are actually underwater on their auto loan. Meaning they actually owe more on the car than they are getting trade-in value for. That is an absolute horrible place to be. If you're in that place, I would argue you have not mastered the stability level of wealth at this point. Well, I found it interesting because we've done some auto shows in the past. And when Daniel, because I remember when he first showed me the stats of average car purchases and then the extended period of time that's 69 or 72 months. Because by the way, that's a that's a decrease. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We went from 69 months was the average that's right. to now 72. Because this trend, even I don't know when it turns into 84, but we're definitely headed sure. on that. But what I find interesting is that when I see that number in the 30,000, I think it's like $36,000 mm -hmm. is average debt on a car loan. You're like, they are horrible decision makers. And then you see that stat of one in three are trading in vehicles that are underwater. People aren't actually buying super expensive cars. It's that they're trading in cars that they still owe a ton of money on, having to roll just that into. In. You will never, ever, ever catch up if you're just building debt upon debt. You're actually turning compounding interest upside down and working against you. That is a complete disaster. So stay away from that huge mistake. I know you want to look cool. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how do you do this appropriately so you don't get yourself stuck. I know we also... Here's one other thing, Bo. We did an entire kind of discussion on this. We've had it, and I don't. I guess we didn't want to put it in there because we've used it so many other we've times. We've talked a lot about it. Credit cards. Credit cards, you know, the average interest rate on a credit card is somewhere right under 18%. Right. And what I find interesting is that, I mean, close to 55% of America does not pay it off monthly. That's right. So, guys, this is, a, this is an epidemic that we have here in America is that we're using credit card debt to bridge faking it until you're making it. And not. Th and I know how that works. You're thinking when you do this, when you use this credit card to subsidize your life and make it easier, you think, I will pay that back, I'll catch up, and then I'll get ahead again. The problem is, is not only are you subjecting yourself to punitive interest, you're also subjecting yourself that you're missing out on letting your army of dollar bills get to work for you. If you cannot pay off credit cards every month, you're screwing it up and doing it wrong. You can't even, I don't even think you should use credit cards if you're not paying them off monthly. I think that's exactly right. Now, you did not hear us say don't use credit cards. You did not hear us say don't let that be a valuable tool in your tool belt. But if you are someone, just like you said, that can't manage it well and that carries a credit card debt balance, credit cards aren't for you, plain and simple. You have to be of a financial mutant mindset to be able to use those. All right, so those are some of the traps to avoid. Those are some of the ways that we've gotten here. 
If I am in the stability stage, what are some signs that I've done it well? What are some things, some, some indicators that I'm doing it the right way? Yeah, so the first thing, I mean, and by the way, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't sure. hold it up, snap it around so you get the good audio of it. If you just go to moneyguy.com slash resources, we have a free deliverable mm -hmm. on the financial order of operations. Yep. And this thing, it turns out, and, and I hate this is this is the truth. Money does have an instruction manual. Absolutely. We tell you what to do with every dollar. So go check out the free deliverable. But the first indicator is you have step one deductibles covered, meaning your life is not going in the ditch. You're already over the thousand bucks. You're already congratulations. You're in the top 40% of the country just by having a thousand bucks. That's exactly right. You've covered that. You've also mastered step two. You're not walking away from free employer money. You're not missing out on that employer match. We've already talked about this. You don't have any credit card debt. You've knocked out other high interest loan types of debt, whether that be stores or other types of high interest debt. You're not dealing with that anymore. And then food step number four, you're starting to build your emergency reserve. You are moving towards that three to six month of expenses to know that you do have some stability in place. Yeah, and then the other thing, you're focusing on the things that you can't control. You're insuring yourself, you're protecting your family right. in case you had a premature death, if you had a disability. And what I'm talking about, guys, go look at term life insurance. Yep. 10 times your income plus any big outstanding debt you have, and it's going to be cheap. That's why we say term. And then base it off of, I mean, if you look at 20, 25, or 30-year term, I think you'll be surprised. It's pleasantly affordable. Absolutely. Disability is somewhat affordable, mm -hmm. too, but you cannot overlook what happens if you're not here to fulfill all the goals and obligations you have to your family. And I think one of the things that if you've done this, if you've worked through these first four steps and you've kind of mastered these, it shows that you have a healthy relationship with debt. And yeah. the easiest way to measure whether or not you have a healthy relationship with debt is if you are indeed walking through the money guy rules. You're following the rules of thumb. When it comes to buying a car, you do 23.8. You put 20% down, you don't finance for any longer than three years or 36 months, and your total auto payments do not exceed 8% of your gross income. And Bo, I have a big rule on this too. Mm -hmm. There's actually two big rules. First of all, guys, because this will protect you whether you're buying new cars, yep. buying used cars, is that you never ever wants your car payments exceeding your monthly investments. That's Meaning right. that, and that's why the rule says, monthly investments have to, have to exceed your monthly car payment. I don't care if, even if you're buying a clunker, you think you're being very reasonable and the car payment is $150 yep. a month, you better be investing at least $150. But what I also like about this is, my younger listeners, you know we have you know nice cars like a Tesla mm -hmm. or something like that. And I see a lot of you guys, you're financial mutants, but you're, you're, you're just itching. You're itching. You have a good job. And you're like, I'd like to have a Tesla too because those things look so cool. Mm -hmm. I want to get in on the craze. But it doesn't make sense to have an $800 to $1,000 car payment while you're only putting $300 a month into your Roth IRA. Exactly right. We got to flip that around. I want you to put $1,000 a month into your investments and have a $200 yep. car payment or pay cash. And also, Teslas, as much as we've done shows on it, they fall into that category. Any luxury car mm -hmm. or premium brand, 12 months, same as cash. You don't get to do 23.8. Nope. You get to do one year, same as cash. And the reason I even give you the one year is I'm always trying to give you flexibility and margin because maybe your cash flow, maybe you have a big year in bonus. Sure. Maybe you have um, some a distribution from your company. I try to give you some flexibility, but don't take advantage and make sure you're conservative with all of your structure. So make your auto purchase as well. Also make sure that your total housing expenses don't exceed 25% of your gross income. And then when you add up all of your debt, so whether it's student loans or auto loans or credit cards or houses or whatever the debts that you carry are, make sure that your total debt service on a monthly basis never, ever, ever exceeds 35% of your total gross income. Yeah, because that's going to let you leave room for life, for savings, doing all the and giving to charity. Mm -hmm. That's going to leave a lot of room. You don't want to get yourself so covered up in debt and obligated expenses that you feel kind of really burdened yep. when you should be feeling really free and enjoying life. Now, what I think is interesting, Brian, is we did a ton of show prep talking about, you know, really, we just showed that like half of America roughly doesn't get past stage one. 
Yeah. Half listen. of America doesn't even grow past the stability. Even though we're talking to financial mutants, even though we're talking to the cream of the crop out there, the vast majority of your peers and colleagues don't even make it past step one. And that saddens me. But what doesn't sadden me is that you guys are here listening to this show, adding to your knowledge base so that you can advance through the levels of wealth, what takes us to level two.